When I came here and I saw the interest that this town was putting in history and I saw my place in it, the Melanson settlement, and I saw my place in it, the deportation of the Acadians from here, I saw my place in it, Acadian expansion along this river. Then I started participating in telling the story. It becomes a vocation. It, you don't plan on doing it. It happens because you have a passion for it. And uh, I see myself kind of as the elders in the Mi'kmaq community, the storyteller that keeps some of the stories alive, you see. Because if nobody tells them, when I'm gone, and if they're not written, people might forget. It's easy. It just takes a couple of generations to turn a town around and to lose that identity as a town. I find this town has welcomed me with open arms, and that gives me the passion to do what I can to help this town out, to help myself out, because when I'm doing something like this, it invigorates me. Hey everyone, it's Adam here with another episode of my Unsung Heroes series. Uh, today, I'm interviewing Alan Melanson, who's from this area right here, Annapolis, Royal Nova Scotia, that's Fort Anne behind me. Uh, he's been a champion of culture, uh, an Acadian storyteller and story keeper in this area for decades. And he's in his 60s now and he's still going strong. Uh, he's lived an entire life that's been vocational, dedicated to all this type of stuff. Right now, I'm looking at one of the oldest views that Europeans saw when they entered the New World here. Champlain landed in this area, and eventually it turned into what you see behind me. I hope you enjoy this great set of stories with Alan and a story about him as well. Enjoy. My name's Alan Melanson. And I'm a 10th generation Acadian whose ancestors started here, but after the deportation went to La Baie Sainte Marie, Claire. I grew up back in the woods, a little town called Carberry. And it had a dirt road. There was no rink, no ball field, no theater, no amusement park or amusement centers. No, nature and what surrounded us was our amusement. As kids growing up, we were a family of four. Myself, I'm a twin. My twin brother, Wayne Melanson, worked at Port Royal Habitation on the other side of the river for 40 years. I worked here. We went to school together from grade primary to grade 12 in the same classroom. We went to university together and we worked to part with parks together. Unfortunately, he passed away of cancer just uh, last summer. So I've got to do the work of two people now, but he's given me the strength to be able to do it. I've got wide shoulders. But to say that when we grew up, we made a baseball field in our backyard. Kids from our area would come and play baseball home. Another friend down the hill, they had a pond. So we'd use that as a hockey rink. We grew all our crops there. Uh, my father might go hunting, get some meat, but we bought meat at the store as well. But we only, only had to buy things we could produce ourselves from the, at the store. We could grow all our potatoes, all our carrots, all our, our string beans, that sort of stuff. We cut our firewood off our own land. We've been doing it since the 1830s, because our house was built in 1835 in Corbury. We, the Melanson family, were, no, not the richest family. We were maybe not the poorest, but we were not among the, no, not the, not the richer class. All four of us, we were the first ones from Corbury to all go to university, all for this high school, all get degrees. And so my brother and I both worked in tourism with Parks Canada for our career. My sister was a school teacher and my brother and this is what I'm really proud of, Richard. He was a lawyer. He went to Dalhousie Law School, didn't have any connections to get in there. He wrote the tests and they had an interview and he was accepted and he finished first in Dow Law School when he graduated. In grade six, I might have learned two paragraphs of the early French settlement. Everything was in English. There were no French tool texts were in text when I was in school, even though we were French, although the, the teachers were often Acadians and they'd speak French if they could in the classroom, but the texts were all in English. Now, there was a, a French school system in the province, you see. But um, when I came here in 1977, 
That was my first year. I just finished my first year of university. And before the season ended at the university, I remember walking down the hallway, and there was a poster there that said, Jaws with Parks Canada. That's going to be bilingual. So, well, geez, I'm bilingual. Maybe I should apply. And I applied. I, to, I went to work at Lewisburg because that was the biggest site in Canada for historic interpretation. So I went for the interview, and they said, well, we're interviewing for Fort Anne Port Royal and Grand Pre. But uh, I said, well, can you do an interview for Lewisburg? And they said, oh, yeah, we can. So I did the interview. And uh, then I got a response that they were only hiring folks from Cape Breton to work at those sites because, you know, they were trying to create employment. But I got a call from Halifax and said, look, you did great in your interview. If you want a job at, you qualify for our competition. If you want a job at Port Royal Habitation, report there. So I said yes, and that's how I started. But when I came here, all that was interested, it was a summer job. Later on in the early 80s, when he started doing archaeology, we found the Melanson settlement. I could see those are my roots. Charles Melanson's my ancestor. I could go up there and stand where the foundations are and feel a connection and look at the landscape and see I can understand why they settled here. That's when I took a deep interest in this. And so I bought a house here in 1991. I retired in 2012. And I, now that I'm retired, I still try to interpret the story here. I feel really that I'm standing on real history when I'm standing here. I've worked at Grand Prix. It's a nice emotional site, but there's not much real from what was there back then. Port Royal Habitation is where I started. That's a nice site, but it's a reconstruction. But when you're standing here on these grounds, this was built in 1702. This was not called Fort Anne. It was called the Fort de Port Royal. It was built by the French. The first fort built here, people don't know, was a Scottish fort. And the first Scottish expedition to spend time uh, year round here was actually on these grounds right here. 1628 to 16, well, they came in 1629 and stayed here until 1632. We get our name, our flag, and our coat of arms from the Scottish presence here in the early 1600s. My father was a hard worker, never took a vacation in his life. His father died when he was 18, so I had to raise his own family. He had about five brothers and sisters, and then after that, he got married later at 33. He had his, our family, so he worked to provide for his family and our, our own after that. But he told me once, if you have to do something today, do it to the best of your ability. If you can do it tomorrow, hey, wait, enjoy today, not coming back. He lived that way. He never had a heart attack, no strokes, no diabetes, uh, no major medical conditions, and he lived to be 95. My mother used to worry about everything. She was a goner at age 76. So there's something to be said about enjoying time and enjoying today while you're living it. I first came here in 1977, but uh, the town was dilapidated. And what brought me here in 1991 was when this was all refurbished. We redid all these old buildings. We tried, turned old buildings into uh, restaurants. We refurbished the um, theater. And it's kind of a landscape that looks cared for. We can see a 1708 building behind me here. Second oldest wooden building in Canada. The only way for a house to last is for somebody to look after it. The government can't look after everything. The Annapolis Heritage Society is gonna look after that building. And folks have to take pride in maintaining their heritage to make this a destination. I'm at the Annapolis Royal Lighthouse, which was built in 1889. This is important to me in Annapolis Royal because uh, it's now owned by the Historical Association of Annapolis Royal, which my wife is the president. I was president before. And we bought this, my wife bought this from the Coast Guard on our behalf in 2004 for $1. At the time, they were trying to get rid of lighthouses that were not serving any purposes. And we said, we don't want somebody to buy this. Demolish the lighthouse, it's a prime real estate, right on the waterfront, and build a, a restaurant or a hot dog stand or a house. We said we'd like to preserve the lighthouse, so it would be a marker of our, our past, and so we bought it. And we've been looking after it now for, well, 18 years. And uh, we just won a competition a couple of years back called This Lighthouse Matters. It was run by RBC, World Bank Canada, and TELUS. And what they did, they wanted people to show support for the lighthouses. You could enter the lighthouse, 
You had three weeks, you could vote once a day, and the people with the most votes would win the prizes. So of all the 26 lighthouses in Nova Scotia that entered, although at the time we were the smallest town in the province, Annapolis Royal, we had only 491 people, we won the most votes in the province. We actually used the money, it was $40,000, to buy the best shingles you can buy in Canada. And so we got a contractor from this area, Stephen Squires, and he fixed the whole thing for us. And so we hid the wires underground, we landscaped the place, and so now we have a nice public area that people can sit here, come here for tours, we've had concerts here before, so it serves a vital place in our heritage, and it will always be a lighthouse. And it's where the Historical Association of Annapolis, Royal, who owned it. We've been around since 1919. So other than the Royal Nova Scotia Historical Society, we're the second oldest historical association in Nova Scotia. We do actually three different tours to raise money for ourselves. We do a, a, an Acadian Mi'kmaq tour along the waterfront. We do a National Historic District tour, and at night, we'll be going in the graveyard a bit later, I do a candlelight graveyard tour. So this is kind of our headquarters for our tours. Now at the Aquatitec Amphitheater in Annapolis Royal, which is an outdoor venue, and Aquatitec means where they met, the meeting place. And along these shores, in the 1604, when Champlain de Mont sailed in here, they met and interacted with the Mi'kmaq people. I will say though that there were interactions with the Mi'kmaq long before Champlain and de Mont came to this area. Fishermen from Europe were coming off the coast of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, uh, drying their catch, trading with the Mi'kmaq, and going back to Europe for the winter, you see. We wanted to make a place along our shoreline where we could celebrate all our cultures. And so, in the amphitheater behind me, it seats about 500 people, but we've had as many as 2,500 people here for a J.P. Cormier concert once. So there's three live music features a week in the summer. We also have Pilates classes and Zumba classes down there, and my wife and I, well, she's from Texas, Darlene, and she, uh, does line dance classes. So it's a, a great venue. There used to be a garage here, but we had to dig everything up, made the terrain into a natural landscape for a nice outdoor amphitheater. And we're fortunate to have here in Annapolis Royal. I'm now gonna take you to a site that's often overlooked but very important in Acadian history, the deportation site from Annapolis Royal that took place on December 8, 1755. It's also personal to me because my family was deported from this site. And I'll go on the wharf to tell you the story where it happened. King's Wharf, built in 1740 by the British, it was 150 meters long. There was a T at the end, so you could have access water at all, all tides. It's a site where the Acadian deportation from Annapolis Royal took place. This is kind of the staging ground here. On December 8th, there were 1,664 Acadians who were brought here. They were loaded on seven ships bound for the destinations of Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, North and South Carolina. And they were, guard, they were taken by one escort ship, a military ship to keep uh, Baltimore, that would guide these seven ships as far south as New York. Anybody going beyond New York? They were on their own. So among those people deported from here was my ancestor. He was third generation here, Ambroise Melançon. He was 70 years old in 1755. He and his second wife, Margaret Como, she gave birth to 12 children. I'm the descendant of 10 of 12 of that second marriage, or 19 of 21. So uh, that's this Ambroise. And at 1755, he was uh, 70 years old. He, his wife, and two of the children would have walked here, got on the ship, and bound out the basin, Bay of Fundy, and then down to the Atlantic seaboard, of what were then British colonies. They were not the United States yet. We were on a ship called the Pembroke bound for North Carolina, 232 Acadians aboard. So when they arrived at New York Harbor, they were not escorted, no, escorted any further. 
But the captain of the Baltimore said, those got cables on that ship, some pretty strong ones there, you gotta be careful. When we hit open water, going for the Carolinas, the Acadians were allowed to come out from the hold of the ship, six at a time, to take fresh air. So we sent the six strongest guys on the first shift. Half an hour later, when it was time for an exchange, it was already planned. These guys stayed on top, the next six rushed up. The 12th turned on the British crew. They were able to capture the ship, the only ship captured in the whole deportation times. They sailed it back north. They made their way to the mouth of the St. John River, which is just across the Bay of Fundy from here. And then they filtered up the St. John River Valley, and most of the people made their way to Quebec, which was still French territory, hadn't fallen to the British yet. But when they got there after all this, smallpox epidemic. So Ambroise's uh, wife died. But I'm lucky that I'm the descendant of the 19th child. His name was Etienne Nazar. That's French for Stephen. He had managed to escape. He hid in the woods. And then when the war was over, in 1763, with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, Acadians were allowed to come back. They had to take an oath, but now everything but Saint-Pierre et Miquelon was under British rule anyway, so you were on British territory. They came back here. We couldn't get our former lands because this was all given to New England settlers. They're called the New England planters. And between 1759 and 1768, over 8,000 people came and populated from here all the way up the valley. And that was the first time that there were more English-speaking people in Nova Scotia than there were French Acadians and Mi'kmaq. So since we couldn't get our lands back, we petitioned for lands. And I'm lucky, in 1768, we were granted land about an hour's drive from here, in the French district of Clare, or La Baie Sainte Marie. That's where I grew up. People had to change their lifestyle from farmers to fishermen, because as you go up the valley, rich, fertile land. As you go down towards Yarmouth, barren, rocky land. So we made a change and adapted well. Because today, the Acadians of Southwest Nova do a great job of fishing those waters. It showed a resiliency to come back and start again. So now we're on been here for four or five generations. I've still got some of the original land grant in my home area of Corbury, in the interior. It's an area you learn to be self-sufficient and independent. The character that the Acadians demonstrated here when they came here were pretty well abandoned by France. They had to look after themselves. They traded with the French and the English. So this river basin that was first populated in 1636 by the Acadians and for the next 30 kilometers, or about 18 miles to paradise, this is the Port Royal of the Acadians. It's the cradle of Acadia, the Berceau de l'Acadie. If you look here, you see grass. That's right. But what we plan to have here for 2024, the World Congress of Acadians, is a monument that will mark this site as a deportation site. The wharf and the, uh, the basin here. Uh, the Historical Association of Annapolis Royal, we're gonna donate about at least $10,000 to have a monument and a marker, an inter panel put here. We can ask the monument to be made in the form of a ship bench, granite bench, so you can sit on the bench, view the landscape, and think about what happened here. As a mass, and symbolizing also a cross, we're gonna have a big piece of steel that will go about 14 feet high. And so this will be a visible monument, and on the accompanying, or maybe on the back, we've got permission from Ben Proudfoot, who's a Nova Scotian. He's based in LA now, but if you've followed the Academy Awards, last year, this past Oscars, he won the Oscar for the Queen of Basketball. He had a painting made of the deportation of Annapolis, from Annapolis Royal. It's the only painting I know in existence of depicting the deportation from here. And we'll put that on a plaque, and then we'll say that on December the 8th, 1755, there were 1,664 Acadians deported from the site on seven ships, and we'll name the ships and the destination. Brad Hall is a local stone and steel artist, and he's gonna fabricate this for us. And uh, so we're going full swing, have a ceremony here, unveiling it 
during the World Congress. I don't feel that you can hold a grudge for what happened 250 years ago, 255 years ago. It happened to our ancestors, and it's a, a trying period in our history, but I like to remember those who died, those who suffered, but I don't dwell on just that. I like the fact that now there is a population worldwide of my, probably you know, three and a half, four million Acadians, and we're a community that all traces their ancestry here. And if I walk with a chip on my shoulder all life, my life, nobody's gonna wanna listen to me. I think history should be interpreted giving all sides of a story, and then the listener can decide what, how they interpret this, what they believe about it, and it might incite them to read many more books to find out what they feel is the story. First, when the Acadians came here, this was called La Rivière Anin. Up the river, they had a grist mill using water power to grind wheat into flour, and they also had a lumber mill using water power to saw uh, trees into lumber. The Acadians, we use the natural resources around us. When we do digs, we even find evidence of windmills. It was also very, very important to the Mi'kmaq people. As I mentioned, we're here millennia years ago. But from this point, you can go inland, follow the Alain River, and then do a few portages. You following the lakes and rivers, you can get to Ketchum Kuchik, which is now a national park. So this was a transportation route. You can go up river, you go into the interior of the valley, and if you went down river to where present day Digby is, the Mi'kmaq would pass through the gut and they could paddle with an ocean canoe across the Bay of Fundy, with the knowledge of the tidal pools and the, the, the portage routes, go up the St. John River, then up into the St. Lawrence and arrive in Quebec. And they could do that in about 12 days. And they could get there faster than the European ship because the ships couldn't take that same route. They couldn't portage a boat. If it was not too windy, you could get there faster in a canoe than by a boat. When Acadians do their genealogy, we do find a lot of big Mi'kmaq connections because you know, after first, second, and third generations with very little immigration from Europe in these small communities, it was hard to find somebody that wasn't a second or third cousin to marry. So a lot of us married into the Mi'kmaq population and through marriages and allies with the French, we had a, a, a relationship in war. We never had to worry about defending ourselves against uh, the Mi'kmaq people. Let's say if I married a Mi'kmaq people, a girl and we had a child and went to live with the Mi'kmaq people, accepted as a Mi'kmaq. You were either Mi'kmaq or Acadian, depending on the company you lived, and it was full acceptance. So there was a, a good relationship that was formed, if I can say. And if Acadians do their genealogy, it's long ago, you'll find that a lot of Acadians married into the, the Mi'kmaq population when they first came here. This place, Garrison Graveyard, is my second home. I live not far from here, but for the last 30 years, I've been spending most nights between June and mid-October right here, telling the story of Annapolis Royal to the people buried here. I started this in 1992. It was the 75th anniversary of Parks Canada Historic Sites. Fort Anne is the oldest historic site in Canada. It had been started 75 years prior to that in 1917. So we didn't have any money to do anything with. I said, well, we've got an old graveyard and I can tell a story or two. So I said, I'll do uh, every Wednesday for 10 weeks, I'll do a graveyard tour for the public free. I won't make any money, nobody will make money, but it will be a good activity for people who are interested. So I did it. I was planning just to do it for the summer of, of 1992. But in the fall, a property owner just across, oh, it's one street down here. Uh, Richard and Monica Cobb, they had an inn called the Bread and Roses. He approached me, he said, look, people who stayed here on Wednesday nights, enjoyed that. Telling the story in the graveyard, would you consider doing it on a more regular basis? Well, I said, well, I haven't really thought about it. I said, I just got married this summer, spending all your nights in graveyards would well be the death of a marriage. But uh, I'll tell you something, Richard, History costs money, and nobody gives money to history much in these days. So I said, I don't want to be in a conflict of interest. I work at Fort Anne, I'm a federal employee, but if you could work something that 
I might get a small honorarium and all the money raised for this goes to the Historical Association of Annapolis Royal and it goes to fund projects that help interpret the story of Fort Anne and Port Royal. So Richard went out to the superintendent and he came back and she said she's in accordance with that. So I said, great. Well, I said, next summer I'll start doing it two nights a week. And uh, I said, I'll make a $25 honorarium and any profits will go to the Historical Association. At the end of the season, I think I, 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 think I made $600 for working the whole summer and uh, we took in $603. So uh, I remember going to a meeting for the Historical Association. I was not a member at the time at the church across the street. And I made my report. I said, Mr. President, and the president was Jim Howe, who's been my mentor throughout my Park Center career and following that. I said, Mr. President, I have to report that at the end of the season, we, after paying all the expenses, we have a $3 profit. I was waiting to see. He stood up. He clapped. He said, I've been working in Heritage my whole life. This is the first time I've ever heard of a report of profit from Heritage. So I said, good job. So I said, oh, wow, I thought he was going to say this is the end of it. So it's blossomed from there. I started doing three nights a week, four nights a week. When I retired, I started doing, in 2012, I started doing seven nights a week. And uh, it's been a good fundraiser for our historical association. Over the time, I think we've raised uh, about a quarter million dollars from these tours. And we've used it from, I'll show you a couple of projects in here, but we've also published books and had different events and monuments and such. But I'm gonna move over to a monument. It's one of the monuments that the Historical Association of Annapolis Well, we contributed the majority of this monument in honor of an important person, Rose Fortune. She was born in Philadelphia, 1774, so just before the American War of Independence. And in Virginia, there was a, an, a maybe a governor or soldier, Carlton, said, any slaves who escape and come here and help fight with the British, you will be given freedom. Now, her parents had already escaped, and uh, so she, they were in Virginia, and, and his, her father joined the British forces. Up here, we called them the United Empire Loyalists. In the States, they're called the Tories. So after the war was over, Rose arrived here when she was 10 years old with her parents. And then, when she was old enough, she started a transport business in this town with a wheelbarrow. She goes to the wharves and inns, and she would, in business, she transport goods and luggage. When she got older, one of her descendants took over the company with a horse and wagon. Two generations did with horses and wagons. And in the 1950s, one of her descendants, James Lewis Jr., took over the company with a truck. So it went from wheelbarrow to truck in four generations. Doreen Lewis, who rose to be her great, great, great grandmother, in 1984, she ran for mayor of Annapolis Royal, and by a vast majority, she was elected our mayor. Doreen is the first woman of African descent to be elected a mayor in Canada. So we wanted to honor Rose Fortune, who kind of was the progenitor of this family. And uh, my wife and I, from the Historical Association, we nominated Rose Fortune as a person of national significance. I've never seen a general or a colonel or anybody born without a mother. So women should be recognized in our history as well. And so we do a bit to try and commemorate that, you see. This is another monument we put up, the Historical Association of Annapolis Royal, to mark the Acadian graveyard of Saint Jean Baptiste. From the records, there are about 500 Acadians buried in here between 1632 and 1755, but we use crosses. They've rotted with time. So in 2010, we took, I think, about $5,000 from the graveyard tours, and we had this monument erected written in French and English to mark that beyond us is the uh, Acadian gravesite. And we're doing ground penetrating radar with Map Annapolis, Parks Canada, and the College of Geographic Sciences, and Boreas Consultant from, uh, incorporated from, from uh, Halifax. And we're gonna find the, the limitations of the Acadian graveyard and put markers to kind of mark where it was so you can walk. At one time, both Acadians and British were buried here, but this will be another touchstone 
that people can come here, have their picture, and chances are, if the Arcadians were from Port Royal, they're buried here. I've been doing a lot of history telling in this town for a number of years, but I've got a patient wife. If it wasn't for her and her agreement on the importance of history, I probably wouldn't be doing this. Her name is Derlene. Her maiden name was Dunham, Derlene Dunham. Now she's Derlene Melanson. She calls herself a first generation Texadian. We met in 1991 on the grounds of Fort Ann. She worked in banking in Texas and she had started a travel club with her bank clients saying, if you deposit in our bank, we will have trips that will be, we'll cut all the middle people out. We can get the best trip anywhere in the world for the, the cheapest price. So she started taking people, and they, she's taking people to 26 different countries, she's been all over the world, but she said in 1991, they were gonna go to Egypt on the Nile cruise. All of a sudden, desert storm, Gulf War breaks out. Not too safe for Americans in the Middle East, so they said, well, well we'll have to cancel that and have a second, second option there. So then they finally decided they were gonna go to Russia. But when she was just about to put the documents in the mail, uprising with Yeltsin and Gorbachev and a bit of a uprising in Russia. So they said, well, well, we'll have to cancel that. Maybe the fall. Let's go to New England, Nova Scotia for fall foliage. There was a boat that used to go from Portland, Maine to Nova Scotia called the, the uh, Fundy Prince. So it was a, a cheap deal to come over, have a night in Yarmouth and a little trip in, uh, up to Annapolis and back and they take the boat across. So she threw it in. So they arrived here on September 28th. I remember it was the first year anniversary of a friend of mine. I was supposed to go to his, his uh, party, but I said, well, I said, well, it was busy. I was gonna leave at three, but it kept being busy. And I said, well, look, I'll stay here and I'll leave at five o'clock. At five o'clock, I went out, I saw a bus coming in. I said, well, look, I'll do the bus, Robert. You close the site, then I'll go to the, to the party. So when the bus rolled in, a whole bunch of Texans got here. I got on the bus and gave them a presentation about Annapolis Royal and uh, when I, got, when I got off the bus, I told everybody, oh, if you have any questions, I'll be right here. And my wife-to-be <laughs> came to me and said, I've got a question for you. Are you married? I said, no. He said, how would you like to marry a Texan? Well, I said, Ooh, I hadn't thought about it. You know, uh, he said, you have a house? I said, yeah, I just bought one, actually, by, by coincidence. So uh, he said, well, so we, I snuck a kiss with her on the, one of the mounds where the cannons were, because the boss was in that afternoon, so I, I was able to get a little kiss and tra transfer addresses, and we started writing and calling, and I went to Texas for American Thanksgiving and her birthday, and she came up here for Christmas, because I said, you gotta come in the winter. It's a lot colder and, and uh, no snow than the summer and fall, so I said, she came up and spent Christmas and New Year's up here, went back to Texas, and then we agreed to meet in New York. In February, the Olympics were in France, and I said, we'll go to, We'll go to France for a week or so. So we went to France and uh, traveled around. The first day we took a, a boat trip on the Bateau Mouche on the Seine River, romantic. See the, all the sights of Paris in the water, but I didn't propose there. That's already been done. So later on, we went up the Eiffel Tower, looked around, could see everything. I didn't propose there, already been done. I want to do a unique proposal. So then, that night, we went to Montmartre, the cathedral, where you see all the lights, romantic, sat on the bench there. But I didn't propose there, it's already been done. That night, when we got to the hotel, I said, uh, Darlene, what was your favorite fairy tale growing up? I said, Snow White. That, and he said, oh yeah, that's a nice one. I said, what was yours? I said, well, mine was the Magic Prince. He said, the magic prince, gee, there's something about that that sounds familiar, but I, I don't know that one. Could you read it to me? I said, yeah, I've got it right here. So I stuck out of my suitcase, uh, handwritten by myself with bad penmanship, but you could read it, the magic prince. Because when she left here, going back to the Halifax airport, she left a little note on my pillow, and she put the magic prince. Once upon a time in a faraway land, there lived a handsome magic prince. One day, his heart entwined with that of a gentle princess, and she put three suspension points. Oh, I said, now I know how I'm going to propose. I'm going to write a fairy tale called The Magic Prince, using that as my cover, and tell our story of how we met and what we did. So uh, I drew it up, 
I drew it out from the, my suitcase and I gave it to her and she started reading and it talked about everything. It had pictures, it was 17 illustrations and photos of our trip to, to, to uh, Texas and her trip up here. But then on page 19, on bended knee, it describes a magic prince sliding a, gold, a, a diamond ring on the princess's finger. So as she reads that, I slide a diamond ring on her finger and it said in the story, will you marry me? And the princess says, we, we, yes, yes. So then she had to read that. So she said, yeah, and then that's when I, I proposed. And she said, yes, she couldn't say no, it was in the story. So it meant to happen, you see. And then we married nine months from the minute we met. We met here at five o'clock. Texas is two hours later. So at three o'clock Texas time, it's been 30 years this year of our marriage. And although we've had many experiences and I've bought gifts and everything, one of the things she prizes the most and treasures the most is my fairy tale proposal of the magic prince. So, fellows, if you're gonna get married, you can come to Annapolis Royal, maybe you get inspired for a proposal and uh, try with something unique and that your fiance will say yes, we, oui, and we'll be guaranteed to work. It's important to me. I don't have any children, but this is my legacy. I don't want anybody to have a monument about me, but I want to make myself valuable when I'm alive. I hope that somebody may take this over from me one day. I'm not ready to retire yet. My father lived to be 95. I just turned 65, so I might have 30 more years to go. I want to lead that Annapolis Royal is richer in heritage than when I first stepped here as a 19-year-old and didn't really appreciate what was here. So maybe the next 19-year-old will have something they can appreciate and tell to future generations. So that's kind of my mission in this, and uh, to leave monuments and legacies that people can see and touch and be around so that they can link with their heritage. Because everyone's heritage is important. And that's what I try to do.